Hello and welcome to the second episode of The Financial Incline. I'm John Bovard, owner of Incline Wealth Advisors. And today I'm thrilled to be joined by Walt Gibbler. So for those of you that don't know, Walt grew up on the west side of Cincinnati. He attended St. Xavier High School, went on to play basketball at Loyola University, Chicago. After college, he transitioned to play professionally in Europe. While Walt was playing overseas, he developed a passion for real estate. He now runs the Gibbler team at Coldwell Banker. Uh, Walt has won several awards. Um, a couple of them include the top 30 under 30 real estate agent. And Walt was the number one individual agent in 2018 and 2019 at Coldwell Banker. So the purpose of the call today, Walt is gonna walk us through real estate investing. Walt has experience in investing in flipping houses, um, single family, multifamily, and Airbnb properties. So Walt, thanks for joining us today. I'm excited about it. I've been looking forward to this, John. It's always good when we can uh, spend time together. That's right. That's right. Obviously, uh, I still reminisce on our, uh, our our playing days growing up and uh, the, the battles we used to do in the in the GCL South. So it, it was one of those things. You always being the uh, year older than me, it was always looking up to you and be like, "Oh, how did Johnny Bovard do today? How did he do?" Because I was always the game before you, so it always get to hear that. Yeah, 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 right. But, um, but good. So, so Walt, give us, um, give us a, a little bit of background, um, you know, on you and, and kind of how you got involved in real estate. Sure. So it was one of those, I grew up in a medical family. So my dad was a doctor. I'm the youngest of four. My three siblings are all doctors and they're married to doctors. So it was one of those by default then in college, I was going to be pre-med. So I did the bios, the chems, the, chems, the physics, and I went overseas, played basketball. When I came back, I had seen the one become a surgeon, the other become an OB-GYN. And I'm like, I see that lifestyle. That one looks horrible, but I'm not passionate enough about medicine to go dedicate 10 years of my life to something I don't truly love. And so I was then starting to say, okay, what else can I do? And my dad and I came together and said, okay, well, we each have money. Do you want to start investing in real estate? And so we started doing that and it really opened my eyes to not only can I create wealth and income through that that but then i can also truly help people make help them make one of the biggest decisions of their lives so it was an it was a neat opportunity that was presented when my dad came to me with that yeah that's that's great and um and and i've got to ask obviously we'll talk about the real estate side of things today but but being a, a division three college basketball player i've always you know heard of guys playing overseas so just to touch on that briefly so how did how exactly are those those contracts handled uh, overseas? And then how did how did you like that uh th that your professional career? Sure, it was one that when the same way you get recruited to college and you have all these people that are reaching out to you and doing that, and you you base it off of that. Well, in after college, then I had agents that would reach out to me, and I ended up choosing one of the agents based on their track record and he then went out to these different countries and, were, and got offers. And so it was the same kind of vetting process that you did back in college when you were choosing where you wanted to go. And that's where I ended up landing in Germany, right outside of Munich. Um, but it was one of those that typically how it works, and now it's different for all situations, but usually how it works in European basketball is that each country has their own league. And usually when it's your first year, typically it's a one-year contract, once you then establish yourself, then that's at the time when then you sign a multi-year deal, either with that team or another one. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So thanks, thanks for a little bit of background. That's something that has always intrigued me as I hear about, you know, former great college basketball players going to play overseas. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, obviously in my world, I help clients to, um, you know, build out their investment portfolios and, you know, sure. typically using that stock, looking at stocks and bonds. Um, but there are a majority of my clients that, that like real estate. So if you could just walk us through, so why is real estate kind of a good investment option? Sure. I really liked real estate just because I think it adds a little bit of diversity within a portfolio. Um, and I think that there's not one direct and only way to invest in real estate. I think there's a myriad of different options that you have, whether it's 
buy and hold, either short-term rentals or long-term rentals. You have wholesale, you have flipping, you have house hacking, you have burr, which is a bigger pockets uh, term, but it's one of those, there's so many different ways you can do it. And even within each way, there are different strategies in how you look at it. I think uh, also I liked it because I think your triple taxed advantage, kind of like an SA, a HSA a little bit in terms of not only do you have your ROI yearly on it, you also then have pay down a principal that your tenants are hopefully paying for, but then you have appreciation, which is typically the cherry on top, not something that I look for, but yeah, so that's those three different ways that it's, it's helpful. Yeah, that, that's great. I, um, you know, I, I often hear about some of those advantages as well. And, you know, obviously it has some, some tax advantages that, that come along with that. So sure. uh, definitely a good, it, like you said, it, it's a good diversifier, um, something good to have in your overall you know, investing portfolio. So absolutely. Yeah. And just so we know what you kind of have firsthand experience with. So what type of, of properties do you own? Sure. So I've, I've gone and branched into a few of the different ways that potentially invest. I have a couple that are buy and hold. So I have a couple multi families that are three families. I have seven condos for flips. I have a couple going on right now that are short term that I'll go in there and spend anywhere from three to six months on. And so I'll flip a condo and then I also have a single family house. So I have a condo in uh, Hyde Park and then, and then a single family over in Norwood that I'm working on. And then I have Airbnbs, with the, which are the short-term rentals. And so I have four of those. Two are in over the Rhine and then two are in the central business district downtown. Okay. All right. Great. So, you know, of those, if you're, if you're kind of looking at the, the, you know, the variety of different properties you have, um, sure. first, first part of the question would be, what have you had the most success with? And, you know, which type of real estate investing strategy do you, you know, tend to lead towards? Yeah, I think when looking at it, I think it's along that industry of the bonds versus stocks and the risk that it is with each one of those. I think looking at it's kind of like the long term rentals versus short term rentals with the long term rentals where you may not have the exponential growth. And, but it's more slow and steady, but it'll be there. Then you have the short-term rentals or like the Airbnbs or VRBOs and the volatility is up and down, but it tends to get higher returns. And especially over the last eight months with this pandemic, where it's definitely halted that. Um, so overall though, if we're looking at specific numbers on average for mine, the long-term rentals have been about 16% versus my short-term rentals have been about 28 percent so yeah. um and so yeah so there's there's Makes definitely sense. time intensity and we can talk about that later on of what goes into owning each one and and all it entails though right right and uh for any any compliance officers on the line obviously uh past performance is no guarantee of future <laughs> yeah, exactly uh, right but, but yeah so that makes sense i mean if i had to equate it to investing um you know, your, your Airbnbs, kind of your short term rentals would be, you know, some of your, your small cap companies, um, you, you know, maybe something, a, a recent company that IPO that can be kind of your, your aggressive sleeve of your real estate investing portfolios. And then, you know, you've got your long term rentals, which you could probably equate to your blue chip stocks, um, you know, the companies that have been around for a lot of years, pay a good dividend, pay you good cash flow consistently over time. Um, so yeah, that, that definitely makes sense and, uh, definitely seems like a good strategy that you have in place. So as, as far as, you know, maybe someone that, that might be just getting started, um, you know, in their real estate investing world, um, you know, maybe they're looking for, for a single family or a multifamily, um, typically what does it take to get started and what are some of the, you know, what are some of the lenders looking for? Um, as, as you're getting started with building a real estate portfolio? So when looking at doing a single family house or an owner occupied where you're going to buy and actually live in there versus an investment, typically the owner occupied, you can get a loan up to 95% of the value of the house. So you only need 5% down as opposed to if it's an investment, usually you need 25% down. 
Now, one of the strategies though, even for the newer investors that say, hey, I don't have enough for 25% down. Well, then you can go the route of living in a place and it's called house hacking. And you can buy a place as a single family, live in there, and then rent out one of your rooms to someone else to help pay that mortgage. And so that allows you to start getting into the game of doing that. And then you can go buy later on, you can go buy another single family house and house hack that and then keep your first one, just keep renting it out and then right. do the same thing with the next one, rent out a room, live in there for some period of time, and then try to move that strategy to where you just rent out the entire house again and go buy another place. And so that's one of the ways that you can get it to where you're only 5% down and not buying it strictly for a rental and needing that 25%. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Have you seen this? I mean, is that common obviously with, you know, duplex properties or even fourplex properties where, yeah, that can, you know, you're, you're living in one and then somebody else is paying down, paying down your mortgage. So it does happen. It's when you, when you start getting into the details of like a duplex versus a three or four family, you do have to start putting more percent down than just a 5%. And so then you start getting into living in one, but you still need another 20% down. So it becomes a little bit more um, complicated, but yeah, so I think a lot of people, and especially I think it's started to go that way where people are starting to try to buy duplexes or three families. And I actually just left an appointment right before we jumped on this phone where someone is going to be buying a three family and they're going to be living in one of the units. So I think it's becoming a lot more common. And I think one of the reasons for that is just because I think people have access to the internet into seeing, okay, how do exactly is this done? And they can research a lot more before it wasn't, I think it was a little bit more mysterious of how do I do that? I don't even know how I'd get into it, but right. with the information that's readily available nowadays, I think it makes it a lot easier to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So, so we're, we're both Cincinnati guys. Um, we, you know, we live here, but every, you know, every city is, is probably similar as far as, you know, the real estate landscape goes. So yeah. when you're, when you're looking at properties, when you're looking, you know, trying to figure out where to invest or where would be a good, a good place, you know, what, what areas or neighborhoods are you typically looking for? Sure. So there's, so basically when looking at different places and saying, okay, where do I want to buy a house or where do I want to buy a property? Usually it's broken down into three classes. So you have like your A class neighborhoods, which is, are typically your most expensive neighborhoods where in that realistically, you're not going to have any return on investment. You're just looking straight for appreciation. And then you have, which in the city of Cincinnati is your Hyde Park equivalent. So then you start looking in your B class neighborhoods where blue collar is peripheral to the A class neighborhoods. And in those, you'll have some appreciation and you'll also have some ROI. And then you get down to your C class and those are the ones you probably don't want to walk down the street at night on, right? And so typically you're not going to have much appreciation at all. Yeah. but your return on investment is going to be through the roof. And exactly. so it's all that it's all of how comfortable do you feel going into certain neighborhoods of what you're trying to look for and what your goal is in, in, in investing. And right. so that's type, that's typically how I look at the neighborhoods and that's how investors will look to see where they feel most comfortable. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm personally like that typically B class to B plus for long-term rentals just yep. because I do want that ROI or the return on investment on my down payment, as well as some appreciation. Now, if I'm gonna go my short-term rentals, I typically only look for A-class in terms of, I wanna be in the heart of it all. I wanna be in over, over the Rhine. I wanna be where people, when they're coming into vacation, are gonna be. And so that's where I stick straight to the, those type of properties that are well-established. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds good. And um, it, is there a certain, so for your long-term, your long-term rentals, are you looking, you know, when, when we look at purchase price, sure. um, you know, obviously, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, his, his famous quote is, you, you make your money when you buy. So yep. is there a certain, a certain price point, or I don't know if you use it as, you know, an ROI percentage or a cash flow percentage? Yeah. Uh, you know, what are that you're kind of looking for uh, when you're looking to purchase properties? Sure. I am always hoping that once I buy a place, I never, after I put my down payment in, ever have to infuse more cash because it's going to be self. 
It's going to take care of itself with the tenants paying, paying me rent every month. And so when I go into those, I start looking about two to 300 is usually like that sweet spot. And one of the things that can sometimes be overwhelming is if you look at it and you're like, wow, there's 78 multifamilies on the property. Where do I even start in looking at one? I think that's where you start looking at your class of yeah. what type of neighborhood. I think then you want to start looking at, okay, if I'm going to say I am looking for ROI, the easiest way to start filtering through those is saying the 1% rule. And basically, does that mean that the gross rent for a one month that you're getting from your tenants is that at least one percent of your purchase price gotcha. so if i bought a place for say two hundred fifty thousand, i would want the gross rent for one of those months to be at least twenty five hundred dollars okay. because if it's not that then it's not going to work into my equation of what the roi i'm looking for and so that way i can easily push it aside and know that that's not the right deal for me let right. me keep looking now i think that's one of those that that's a, that's a very gray way to do it. But I mean, it's a starting point of, otherwise there's no way I can go through 78 different deals every day trying to look for things. Um, now you also have it where some people will say, if the numbers for the most part makes sense in the beginning, well, most of your costs are gonna be pretty fixed. Like your, your loan, more than likely, it's gonna be a fixed loan. So you know you're gonna keep the same payment. Well, if you look at the growth in rent, year after year, if it pretty much makes sense this year in five or eight years when rent keeps appreciating and your, uh, and your loan staying the same, then more than likely it could be a dynamite property, even though it doesn't make the most home run hit right now. Yeah. Yeah. So, that so was that's perfect. where overall long, long answer short is that I'm typically in that two to 300,000 range when I'm looking for a sweet spot. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I love that. I love that analogy, kind of that rule of thumb of, you know, 1% of the purchase price. I think that that's yeah. something very, like you said, it's, it's not a silver bullet, but it's a, it's a great kind of tangible thing that you can, you can start to evaluate. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So then it, a lot of people, um, you know, real estate worries them and, and there obviously are, are risk involved uh, with, with starting to invest in real estate. Um, yeah, yeah there, there's the famous three T's of termites, tenants, and toilets. You, know, you don't want to have to be dealing with either three. Yeah. Um, so, so what are some of, the, some of the downsides of investing in real estate? Sure. So I think one of the best things about investing with you is that I call you up and say, John, I want to take my money out of the market. I need to go do this. You say, no problem. Let me let me get that for you. And within a few days or a week, you can get all that money out of the market if you needed to, if it was an emergency. So the illiquidity of real estate makes it a little bit tougher that you can't just get out. Now, if you're, you have a decent property, hopefully you should be able to get out of it within 30, 60, 90 days, but it's not going to be as liquid as yours. Um, one of the things, it's a little bit more time intensive then not a little bit it's going to be more time intensive than buying stocks or bonds or even REITs where you do get that real estate exposure um, because to your point while you don't ever want to have to answer that call for a toilet you're probably going to have to in your career there's no getting around that now can you go the route of hiring a property management company absolutely you'll lose some of your profit but that at least gets you exposure into it but even they are going to say, hey, this is an issue of it's more than $500. So we're going to call you and say, we need to get approval. And so you're still going to have to deal with it in some manner. So I think those are the two things when looking at it that stick out to me is the illiquidity and the time and how time intensive it is. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And have you seen, you touched on it before with, you know, this year in particular, um, you know, everything going on with, the, with your Airbnb properties. Um, have you seen anything that any issues that you've run into this year as far as, you know, if it's tenants not paying or you know, anything along those lines? Knock on wood. I've been very fortunate to not have that happen to me. And I know 
and I have a pretty tight knit community of people that invest here in Cincinnati and we try to all share ideas and bounce things off each other and get, get an idea of how it's going for them. And fortunately we haven't had a lot of issues with people not paying or trying to play the system and saying, Hey, I can't pay this month. Good luck trying to evict me. So we haven't, we haven't run into that, which has been nice. I think that's one of the things as well is when you start picking your, what class property you're going to buy. Yeah. It's kind of the same to your point of how secure not only is that, that price of the property and where it's going to go over time, but typically the tenants that you have come in there are going to be on that same level. So you're going to have, if you're going to go that, you're going to have people that typically have more secure jobs. And so that's just something to think about as where you're renting or if you're going to go to a C class where you don't want to walk down the street at night, you may have some more issues when it comes to this, or you may have to do um, subsidized housing with Section 8. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's just understanding what you're going to be getting into and the, the pros and cons that come with it. Right, right. Yeah, that all makes sense. So what would you say is your kind of your, your long-term goal for your, your real estate portfolio? Sure. I would say that when I looked and I started getting into real estate and buying properties, it was to create a passive income that replaces my active income. And I think the quote that really stuck out to me when I was, when I was starting into this process is from Warren Buffett. And he says that if you don't find a way to make money while you sleep, you will work until you die. So it's the same concept it was with you of getting that passive income through stocks bonds and that type it's just getting that passive income and so i think that's what i'm really shooting for is how to create that multiple spinning plates where i have more than one revenue source coming in right right yeah i love that um and that's you know, like you said that that can allow you to um you know really become financially free when you're yep. you're not relying on just your earned income um you can you can take your earned income you can turn it into passive income and that will allow you to, you know, free up your time, uh, which a lot of people could, could use. And, and that's great. Yeah. So, yeah. But, so Walt, I, I appreciate you, uh, you joining me today. Um, if you want to check out Walt, check out his website, the um, great stuff on there. And, uh, Walt, I appreciate the time. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on, Johnny.